Can I say it is good to be back home? I'm telling you. There's no place like Social Dallas, and I'm glad not only to be back, but to be kicking off a brand new series today. Y'all, I feel like preaching. Y'all got about six and a half hours for me today. <laughs> now, we won't be in here that long. Some guest was like, is he for real? I promise we won't be here that long, but I do have a word that I believe is going to encourage you today. So go with me as you're standing to honor the reading of God's word to Romans chapter one, Romans chapter one. And I want to look at verses one through seven, and then we'll hop down to verse number 16, Romans chapter number one. Help me thank God for our worship team and our choir who just are the best. Romans chapter one. How y'all doing in the back back? Y'all good? Y'all my people back there. Y'all are my people. Romans chapter number one. I was going to read all 17 verses, but you know our creative director said, that's a lot, that's a lot. I said, I've been gone for six weeks. Can I read them all? But he was like, no, no, just abbreviate it. But it's, it's that good, but just for now, we'll go verses one to seven, then we'll hop down to verse number 16. When you're ready to read it, say yes. If you're not ready, say hold up. I heard a hold up, I'm away. And it declares Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And jump down to verse number 16, which is just packed with power. Paul finally says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God. Ooh, I'm sorry, that had me shouting because he did not say it has the power or it contains the power. He said it is the power of God to salvation for some people, for a few people. No. No. For everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Can you say amen? Y'all, that, that right there, that's no kibbles and bits scripture right there. That is filet mignon. Okay? I know that's not how you say it, but that's how I felt it in the moment. That is some steak right there. I, I want to preach in this brand new series, Back to the Basics. I'm going to entitle this first message, uh, what do I want to call it? Let's call it, what do I want to call it? Put it up there on that screen. Yeah, Diary of a Dropout. The Diary of a Dropout. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. I chose to sit by you. You better not fall asleep on me. <laughs> Look at your other neighbor and say, oh, the neighbor. I got the strange suspicion that this sermon is for you. If you believe God's going to speak, would you give him some praise up in here? I mean, really give him some praise in here today. Father, have your way. Speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord diary of a dropout, but this is the introductory message in a brand new series called Back to the Basics. I hadn't been here in six weeks, so I got to make you say some stuff. Would you just say back, back. to the basics? What I love about this series is I don't care whether you've been in church your whole life or whether you're new to faith or 
whether you don't even believe or acquiesce to the gospel, you just came here today because you're single and somebody told you that you could find your boo here in church. <laughs> no matter where you come from today, I, I'm telling you, this series that we're about to embark upon back to the basics is going to be, hear me, one of the most beautiful, powerful, life-changing, mind-shifting, destiny-altering, boringly exciting series that we've ever stepped into. Did you catch that last one? Boringly exciting. This series is going to be boringly exciting. The reason it's going to be boringly exciting is because we're going back to the basics. Going back to the basics. I felt as your pastor that it's important that we understand the basics, the fundamentals of our faith, the basics of what Christianity is, the basics of what it means to be a Jesus follower, and it's going to be boringly excited. And here's why the basics are vital. The basics are vital because I have found out that humanity has the proclivity to make the complicated simple and make the simple complicated. Have you noticed that? Especially when it comes to a life of faith. You don't know how many people right now are stressed out because they're new to this thing called Christianity and they're like trying to figure out, okay, how do I look spiritual? And they're trying to figure out when do I say amen? And they are under so much pressure because I think we have made this thing called a life of faith way more complex than God ever intended it to be. I do not believe that your relationship with Jesus was ever supposed to be complex. Now, don't don't shout too fast. I did not say you won't have troubles. I, I did not say that you're not going to have some trials. I did not say that life won't hit you upside the head sometime. I did not say you won't have haters. But I am saying, as it relates to your relationship with Jesus, that relationship was not supposed to be complex. He never meant for his relationship with you to be a burden or to be cumbersome. He actually wanted it to be intimate and organic just as easy as you are breathing, just intimate and organic. That's why the Bible says things in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and I remain in you. And guess what? You'll bear much fruit. Isn't that so easy? He just said, just remain, chillax. Just remain and you will bear fruit. How many know you have never seen a tree struggling to bear fruit? You have never seen a branch and walked up to the tree and heard that branch going, apple. You have never heard that in your life. All that branch does is it stays connected to the tree. It just remains. Somebody say remain. remain. That's all you need to do is remain. I know you're stressed out. Remain. I know you ain't read the book of Leviticus. Remain. I know you didn't float in here. Remain in him. The problem, though, with remaining oh, is that sometimes to remain is mundane. It's just mundane to remain. It's just basic to remain. In fact, I've been in church my whole life. It's intriguing. We never show a testimony video of somebody that remained. Nobody shouts about the person that was just faithful, that was just loyal. The, the, the testimonies that we love, that we all shed a tear about, is the person that was like, yeah, I was in church for a little bit. Then I left, then I got on drugs, I killed eight people, and then I was really crazy in the club, but now I'm back, and I realize that he's the lover of my soul. We watch that testimony, we're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, come on back home. We love that story. You have never shouted about the testimony or seen the testimony of the person that said, I was raised in church, didn't stray away, I love Jesus then, I love him now, and I'm still here. Probably still going to be here. Nobody shouts about the person that remains. You know why? Because that's boring. That's basic. But I don't know. Maybe I'm getting a little older. I'm finding out that boring and exciting are not enemies of each other. They actually are best friends. As a matter of fact, it is the trick of the enemy to get you to get obsessed with the exciting so you'll bypass the boring. But I came to tell you, you can never get to the exciting until you first embrace the boring. If, how many of you love the exciting? How many of you love exciting things? Look at all those hands. I've heard people say that about our church. Ooh, social, it's exciting. It's exciting. How many of you don't like the boring? Can I see your hand? You don't like boring? Oh, Houston, we got a problem. Because <laughs> some of y'all that lifted up your hands for exciting and lifted up your hands for hated boring, you're going to run into a problem because I'm telling you, exciting's bodyguard is boring. And you cannot get to the exciting until you first embrace the boring. How many of you know living on a budget is boring? 
making a budget is boring. Ain't nothing as boring as like, this is what I got for Chick-fil-A and this is what I got for Netflix. That is boring. It is way more exciting to just swipe the plastic and figure it out and just take the items home. You don't even got to swipe no more. You just tap it. Tap, put it in the bag. Thank you. I'll figure it out later, but I'm going to kill him tonight with this one. <laughs> it's way more exciting <laughs> to not have a budget, but I'm telling you, that's not the exciting you want. You'd much rather have the boring of a budget so you can get to the exciting of living within your means and actually having enough money to be generous. And when God speaks, you say, here I am as a conduit and a vessel of generosity. <laughs> I'm telling you. You're trying to bypass the boring, but I'm telling you, you can't get to the exciting until you embrace the boring. How many know Brussels sprouts are boring? Oh, they're boring. I don't care. You can make them crispy. I don't care. They steal Brussels sprouts. Okay, you know what's exciting? Crumble cookies. Oh, my God, on today. They are not paying me for this advertisement. I'm telling you right now, I struggle with those crumble cookies. They got a different flavor every single week. Order them every week. $5 $5 for the cookie, $85 delivery charge, but I'm just killing it every week. That's exciting, but I keep eating crumble cookies. I promise you, I'm not going to look very good because there's something about the boring that you must embrace before you ever get to the exciting. And if I was the enemy, if I was the enemy and I wanted to really get you, I would get you obsessed with the exciting that you never go to the basics and the basics are actually what you need, but I came to tell you the basics are boring. The basics are routine, but you can't ever get to the exciting unless you get to the basics. I can tell you about a friend of mine whose life on the surface looks exciting because this dude has money in the bank. Flies private, private chef, all kinds of cars, changes girls every single month. I'm telling you, you can buy whatever he wants, and you look at his life from the surface, and it looks like, ooh, it's exciting. He likes to stunt. Like, it's, ooh, it's exciting. Who lived like this? But then when I talk to him, he's not fulfilled. But then I have another mentor in my life who's been married to the same woman for 40 plus years in the same city, pastor in the same church, going to the same house. And I'm telling you, on the surface it looks boring, but he is more fulfilled than my other friend. Maybe the enemy has us tricked. <laughs> We've been chasing exciting. But God's saying you actually got to get to the basics, to the fundamentals, if you're ever going to get to the real fulfillment. I, I really should blame my son for this series. This is an introductory message. I should blame my son for this series because he was really the impetus for it. He, he started playing basketball. My, my son, Robert Madu III, he started playing basketball. His first time playing sports. You don't know the emotions that hit you as a parent to your kid is playing sports. You don't realize what's in you until your child is playing sports. And I love this league that he plays in because they said, hey, we realize you parents are busy. Uh, we have practice the day of the game, just 30 minutes before. Because we know y'all got stuff going on the other week. I'm like, sign us up. I love that. Get to the practice 30 minutes before. This is his first time playing basketball. As soon as the whistle blows and my son starts playing, it becomes clearly obvious to me that this boy needs more than 30 minutes <laughs> before the game started, okay? Now, don't get it twisted. He's like Steph Curry with it. He's got a shot. Uh, but like fundamentals, like dribbling, no, this boy just carried the ball every single place he went. He's putting his hands up on his own teammates. He didn't have all that together. He needed more than the 30 minutes before. And then I saw other kids on the court. My goodness, these parents did not obey the 30 minutes before. You could tell they were the parents doing all kinds of drills at home. I'm like, y'all not about to have me out here in these streets. I told my son, uh-uh, let's get to the court right now. We gonna practice. <laughs> you need more than the 30 minutes. And there I am with my son, Robert Madu the third. And I'm telling you, true story, we're out in our little courtyard and we're dribbling. I said, okay, here we go, Bubba. Dribble, 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 dribble. He does like two dribbles. Then he takes the ball. I kid you not. And starts trying to do like this. On his, I said, boy, what, what are you doing? He said, daddy, I'm doing Space Jam, DeBron James. And so I said, first of all, it's LeBron James and <laughs> enunciate. And what are you, you, you're not ready for the spin on the finger. You got to get the dribble yet. He said, no, 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 daddy. I, got, I said, no, dribble, dribble. We start doing dribble. Then he starts trying to go between his legs. I'm like, son, no, 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 no. Basics first. You, you learn how to dribble first before you start trying to spin it on your feet. You are not DeBron James. And I wonder if there's so many believers today, 
you trying to jump into like Space Jam. Because you know, you come to church, you see those Space Jam believers. <laughs> They're just out there in space. They just feel like, man, God always speaks to them. They always got a prophetic word. And you, you're trying to do that. And God's like, hold on, basics. How about we just get you just spending like two minutes in the word, just with me by yourself. Let, let's just get to some basics first. Let's, let's get you consistent in community first. Let's, let's just start with the basics before you start doing all this. Because I'm telling you, the power is never in the brilliant. It's always in the basics. As a matter of fact, if you ever stand in awe of somebody that did something brilliant, please believe that behind the brilliance was the basics. Nobody starts off playing Mozart and Tchaikovsky and no, you don't start off, you start off ding, ding, ding. That's how you start. It is a principle that cannot be violated in life. You can never get to the brilliant until you first make a commitment to say, I'm going to keep doing the basics, even when it's boring, even when I don't feel like it, even when it doesn't make sense. I'm going to do the basics. How many illustrations you need? I got them for days. Martial arts, you better get to the basics first. Come on, it's the same in every movie. It's some kid that's ready to ah, do all the fighting, and there's always some master that says, not yet. Wax on. <laughs> wax off. Why I got to do that? Because I said, wax on. Wax off. Carry the bucket of water on both hands. And there you are, right when you're frustrated with all them basics, and then when a real enemy comes and attacks, you didn't even realize that God was doing something in the basics. And you're wondering, how did I react? Like, I didn't know that was in me, because you went to the basics. Go out there without them basics if you want. See, don't knocked upside the head telling you, we better get back to the basics if we're going to fight the enemy that's coming against us. Oh, I love what that great theologian Bruce Lee said. He said, fear not the man that has practiced one kick 10,000 times, or rather 10,000 different kicks. He said, fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Did I butcher that? I'm going to rewind to give it to you again. He said, fear not the man that has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Just the basics. Pew, pew, pew. That's who you should be afraid of. Because the basics give you the power for that which is brilliant. In this series, we're going to look at the basics. And in order to look at the basics, we got to go to our textbook. And how many of you know we got an amazing textbook today? This is our textbook. It's the Word of God. I love with Lisa Harper. Did you enjoy Lisa Harper when she was here? Wasn't she amazing? She dropped a bar. She dropped a bar. She said, go get you a Bible, a real one. I love technology. I'm with it. Somebody just set me up a TikTok the other day. I don't know how to work it, but somebody going to post some stuff on it for me. But go get you a Bible. She said, get you one that you can feel and that you can hold and get in the pages. This is our textbook. And I've said this before, but I want to say it again as it relates to the basics and this word of God. You need to understand that the Bible is not just a collection of random stories by which we just pop open and extract some truth from. So many of you approach your Bible like it's a fortune cookie. And you just pop it open and say, I'm going to pull this out today. The Bible is not just a collection of random stories. The Bible is actually one single story. It is a single story about a God that created a world and a humanity that he was in love with and had perfection. But the problem is we were disobedient. We disobeyed his word and his command that brought sin into the world. And all of a sudden he began a rescue mission to redeem that which he loved. And he set out to redeem every single one of us. And how many of you know he did? did accomplish that mission when he died on the cross and got up from the grave but the story is still being written because he will come back again in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we shall not all sleep but we will be caught up to be with him it is a single story of a humanity that jacked up the world and a God who redeemed them because we could not get out of the mess that we got ourselves into it is a single story. It is a single story. If you like things clear and concise, let me give you the whole Bible in a nutshell. The Old Testament, the Old Testament is simply the anticipation of Jesus. The Gospels are the presentation of Jesus. 
In the Old Testament, they were saying, when he comes, when he comes, they waited with tiptoe anticipation. When he shows up in Bethlehem in the Gospels, that is the presentation of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts is the continuation of that which Christ started because he said, no, 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 no. I did not just come to earth to do miracles and then to leave. No, I tagged you before I left and now you have power to do that which I did because when I was on earth, I was limited to one space and one region, but now that my Holy Spirit is going to be on the inside, inside of you, empowering you. You can be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So tag, you're it. Acts is the continuation. But when we get to the epistles, the letters, that is the explanation and the clarification of that which Jesus did. Revelation is the consummation of Jesus coming to us, and we will be with him He is the bridegroom. We are his bride. But we need those letters. We need the epistles because they bring explanation and clarity to that which Christ did. And in this series, we're going to look at the greatest one, the book of Romans. Romans, oh, it makes my right toe tingle. The book of Romans is powerful. If you ever perusing a Roman through your Bible, just stop at the book of Romans because it is in Romans that the Apostle Paul gives the greatest explanation of the gospel. You want to talk about back to the basics? The Apostle Paul writes to the Christians and the believers in Rome so they can have the ABCs of what this faith is, what the gospel is, what for forgiveness is, what justification is. You realize that every revival that started in church history started with somebody that got a revelation that was rooted in the book of Romans. Martin Luther was transformed by the book of Romans and started the Protestant Reformation because he realized when he was under the weight of his own works that was not working, that all of a sudden he got a revelation that I am justified by faith. Not my record, but God's record. William Tyndale and all kinds of people, Augustine, all of them were moved by this book of Romans. It is powerful. It is pregnant with potent truth. It is a theological treatise of everything you should ever know about what he did on the cross. I'm losing some of y'all in here. I told you it's going to be boringly excited. Can I tell you, if you want to know about the will of God, read the book of Romans. If you want to know about the wrath of God, read the book of Romans. If you want to know about the plan of God, read the book of Romans. If you want to know about the grace of God, read the book of Romans. If you're stuck up and religious and think you all that, read the book of Romans and remind yourself that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Translation, you ain't all that. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. If you are so under the weight of condemnation and you think what you've done is so ratchet and so messed up that God can't use you, you better read the book of Romans because Romans says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's all in the book of Romans. If you think you can live however you want to live, please read the book of Romans and let chapter 6 just hit you in the head where Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The book of Romans is powerful. If you're struggling with how you can be in the world, but not of the world, read the book of Romans because right around chapter 12, he'll tell you, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Be no longer conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's all in the book of Romans. If you're wondering if God's going to work something out at home, please read Romans because you'll know that all things work for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That's Romans. If you're wondering If you're wondering if anybody has your back, you feel like you've been stabbed in the front and the back, people have walked away, read the book of Romans. It says, if God be for us, who, who can be against us? All of that is the Apostle Paul writing with brilliance and wisdom all in the book of Romans. 
you realize even lawyers today, some schools will look at the book of Romans because Paul so eloquently argues almost like a lawyer in a courtroom giving his own litigation of the power of what God did when he put on human skin and became sin for us. All of that is in the book of Romans and it's written by the apostle Paul, the artist formerly known as Saul. And I love it because Paul was brilliant. Paul was educated. Paul was competent. Paul was committed, hear me, before his conversion experience. Before he had a collision with God, he was already brilliant. He was already committed. He was already powerful before his conversion. I say that to tell somebody who thinks that once you put your faith in Jesus, you have to lessen who you are. How I many know when you put your faith in Jesus, that's not a time for you to dismiss the natural giftings and callings and things that God has put on the inside of you. You're supposed to take that same energy, that same passion that you had before you had an encounter with God, and that's supposed to transfer, transfer into the kingdom of God. That's what Paul did. The same dude that would hunt you down no matter what it took and kill you as a Christian is the same dude that said, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure the church gets built. Do you see that? See, some of you think you're supposed to turn down when you come to Christ. Absolutely not. You're supposed to turn up. How is it in the world you were the person that everybody knew how to call, you know how to coordinate the party, everybody knew you were going to make sure the DJ was right. I mean, you're all in the world. You were a connector, and now you come into church, and you're walking around like you're a monk, and you can't speak to nobody, and you act like you're in a witness protection program. No, you better use that same gift. Get in a connect group. There's a leadership call on your life. The same energy you gave to the world, you want to give to the kingdom. That's what Paul did in a moment. Went from killing to building. The Apostle Paul said, I'll do whatever it takes. I gave everything before my experience. Why would I not give everything now? So look at this encounter he had. I love it because he wasn't even planning to have the encounter with God. I love that you won't have God on your radar, but he'll have you on his. You should see it all the time. It happens right here in Gillies. People will come in. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. People come to Gillies. Some of you didn't even want to be here. I see people come in because they just, again, they're trying to find the one. And they came in like this. They're like, I ain't, even, I ain't feeling this church stuff, man. It's so stupid. Why he got skinny jeans on? It's just, it's just dumb. Yes, yeah, whatever. He not even funny. Please. And all of a sudden, by the end of the message, that bottom lip, start quivering, and I'll be on the stage just laughing because I see it happen. I see you walk in like this and end up right here. Oh, that's the beauty of grace. That when you're not even thinking about him, he's thinking about you. The whole time, Paul, please don't miss this, was killing Christians. He was still on the radar of this Savior. Saying, who he don't even know. What's going to hit him? Can I take you deeper? This is going to jack some of y'all up. When he has that encounter with Jesus, all of a sudden God knocks him off his high horse because I don't care how much swag you are. God knows how to bring you to your knees. A bright light shines and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I love it because he was actually persecuting the church. But I love that God said, why are you persecuting me? See the intimacy of the relationship. To persecute the church is to persecute him. He cares about his bride. Don't ever throw away the church. Don't walk away from the church. No, we're not perfect, but it is the thing that he gave his life for, his bride. He said, why are you persecuting me? And I love it. He goes, who are you, Lord? <laughs> Only God could jack you up like that. Well, you answer the question to yourself, who are you, Lord? He's like, that's it. He then says, it's hard for you, Paul, to kick against the goads. Acts chapter 9, if you need a reference. It's hard for you to kick against the A goad was what they used in farming. Whenever you had an ox that had an attitude and wanted to do its own thing, and you wanted the ox to go this way, but it's like, ain't nobody, ain't nobody trying to do all that. It's trying to go this way. But you wanted to go straight. It's like, ain't nobody got time for that church stuff. But you wanted to go this way. You would take the goad and you would poke it. And every time it 
when it gets up, it would get it back in line. He said, Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goat. So the imagery that God is using in that conversion experience lets me know that although that was the moment that Paul had the transformation, how many know God had to already have been messing with him even before that moment? Oh God, who am I preaching to today? You may as well just resist because God is already showing you that your way is not going to work. Some of you, that's why you're here today is because God set you up. You know you wouldn't have been in church before, but you've been fighting and God... He'll do whatever it takes to get your attention. I think Paul saw these Christians die. And I think he saw that if they're willing to die for this thing, it must be real. How are they worshiping while I'm killing them? This must be real. And it was working on his heart. And God brings him to his knees. And the same passion he pursued to kill the church he uses to build the church. And he never got to go to Rome, but he said, I'm gonna write a whole letter so that y'all can know the basics of this faith that I've given my life for. That's what we're gonna look at in this series. Ooh, if you wanna do your homework, just start getting the book of Romans. Because look at how he starts it. He's never met them, so he introduces himself. I, Paul. I love that. Ancient letters, they started off with who they were. You know, our letters are different. We say, dear Billy, then you put your name at the end. I like ancient letters. They did it backwards. They started off letting you know who they were so then you could finish reading. I like that because I need to know who you are before I start reading what you say. Like these people in the church, these, you know, I've seen people in the church send you an anonymous letter. I just want to tell you what I think about you in the church and then it's anonymous. I'm like, please, I don't even read it. (gasps) I want to know who you are first. And he says, I, Paul, then he says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Understand, there's a difference between a servant and a bond servant. That word in the Greek is actually slave. There's a difference between a servant and a bond servant. See, Paul is brilliant. He would have known the distinction. To be a servant meant you would go serve a person's house, but you still had your own house. You could clock in when you wanted. You could clock in when you were done. If you didn't like the master you were serving, you could switch it up, find you another master that was a servant. A bond servant was different. A bond servant knew they had been purchased by their master. They had no rights. Everything that they were belonged to the master. Do you see how Paul is painting what a relationship with God is supposed to look like? See, we have a lot of servants today, and we have some bond servants. Servants will only go as far as they feel like it. Servants are cool to clock in on Sunday, like, God, I came, I'm here. Came to 11.30, okay. But then they'll clock out on Monday. That's servant, because you can clock in and clock out. But a bond servant realizes I have no rights. All that I am is yours. Wherever you tell me to go, I'll go. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll do. And if you want to know if you're a servant or a bond servant, check your obedience. Check your obedience when he asks you to do something you don't want to do. Quit acting like you got a heart of obedience when your will always lines up with God's will. If your will always lines up with God's will, you might not be serving God. You might be serving you, boo-boo. Because I will testify that he has told me to do some things. Oh, that was not me that I didn't want to do. And that's the litmus test of being a servant or a bond servant is can you obey When it's something that you don't want to do, when it's something you don't understand, how many of you know, my oldest, Evie, if I tell her, sweetheart, I need you to eat three cookies today, she's not going to struggle. She'll say, of course, Dad. In fact, I'll eat four. (laughs) But if I say, eat some broccoli, I I don't like, I don't don't like, I don't like the texture of it. I know she has a heart of obedience when I say, eat the broccoli. Why? And I go, because I said so. That's how you know if you're truly a bond servant. Paul said, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He said, called to be an apostle. An apostle is somebody that is sent. 
somebody this sin. And Paul said, I was called to this. Translation, this was not my idea. Am I the only one? Have you ever had God call you to something that was not your idea and you had to do it anyway? Ooh, can I testify? You know how many people come up to me like, Pastor Robert, can we just get some tips on church planning? We love what God is doing in Social Dallas. I said, oh, here's a tip. I didn't want to do this. This was not my idea. But oftentimes, you're ushered into your purpose and your destiny when you embrace the thing that was not even your idea in the first place. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, and here's the last thing, worship team, join me, and set apart for the gospel. Paul, what are you set apart for? The gospel. Over 60 times in the book of Romans, you'll hear that word, gospel. We're getting back to the basics. If he says so beautifully, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power. Not it has the power, it is. The, the gospel is. If the gospel is my power, I better know what the gospel is. Because maybe part of the reason I don't have power is because I don't know what the gospel truly is. I think, I, I love it. I love that our church is, is, is charismatic. We're spirit-filled. Y'all know how we get down. God does awesome things. I'm all for prophesying. I'm all for laying hands on people and they fall out and you got to get the courtesy blanket. I love it. But do you know what power is according to Paul? It's the gospel. The power is connected to how well you know the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news. That's the definition of the gospel. It is good news. Hear me, not good advice. Good news. In other words, the imagery is there's a battle that's being fought. And anytime they had a battle, they would have what they called a herald. And it was the job of the herald that once the battle had been won, that herald would now run into the village with all the strength and fortitude that herald could muster. And it was the herald's job to run into the city and say, hey, guess what? We won. We've got the victory. We're no longer under the oppression of our enemy. I'm coming to tell y'all the good news. We won the victory. That was the good news. It was the gospel. That's, that's the imagery. It's of a herald running. It became so good that this is where we get this phrase. How beautiful are the feet on the mountain of those that come with good news. Because after a while, they started noticing from the mountain while they were stuck in the oppression of their enemy, while they were waiting for the report of those who had risked their lives for them to win the battle, a battle that was a representative battle that if they won, everybody else would get the victory. While they were in the town waiting, waiting for the news, are we going to be in oppression or are we going to be free? While they would wait on the mountain, they would look for the herald and they began to notice that if the herald was running slow, if the herald looked tired. They already knew before the herald got there that they had lost and they were going to be in their chains for a long time. But if they looked out in the mountains and that herald's feet were moving like Sonic, they already knew from his feet. Oh, we not, can't wait till he gets into the town. We better start celebrating right now because his feet are moving fast. That means we won the victory. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. That's what the gospel is. And maybe you're not shouting because you don't know what the good news is. The good news has to be followed by the bad, confronted by the bad news. And the bad news is we were stuck in our sin. There was no hope of redemption. Sin blocked our connection to God. But I'm so thankful that Jesus already had a plan before the foundation of the earth. He said, I'm going to come from heaven to earth. I'm going to put on human skin. I'm going to be born of a virgin that matters. Because if I was born by an ordinary man, I would still have the same generation of sin on the inside of me, but my blood has to be pure. My blood has to be enough to cover the sins of the world. 
That's the good news. You only understand the good news if you know how bad the bad news is. That the greatest tragedy in the world is not economic depravity. The greatest tragedy in the world is not even sickness or disease. The greatest tragedy is sin. That is the sickness for which there was no cure. And Paul says, this is the good news that has the power. We got to go back to the basics. The power is not in your record. It's not in what you've done. Who else would know this but Paul? He was a Pharisee. He did everything by the book. He did everything right. But he realized he was still falling short. He realized that his record was not enough. And that's why he pins, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because I've learned through trial and error that it is not my record, it is his. It is not what I'm doing, it is what he has done. And if you ever get numb to the power of the gospel and what he's done for you, and that you have not only been forgiven, but you have been justified, there's a difference between forgiveness and justification. Forgiveness says, okay, I forgive your sin and you can go away. But there's a difference between forgiveness and justification. I'm thankful for forgiveness, but I'm thankful for justification. Justification says, not only have I forgiven your sin, but I now have a sin for you at the table. You don't have to walk away. You have an inheritance. You can come and sit at this table. Not because of your record, but because of his. Yes. The book of Romans is the diary of a dropout because the brilliant intellectual Paul realized that you can't receive the power of this gospel until you drop out. I love the kingdom. The kingdom is the only school when you drop out, they say, guess what? You get to be Val Victoria. Huh, me? You dropped out? Yeah, you flunked everything. We're still going to let you give a speech. Me? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. But I didn't pass chemistry. I know. Come on. Get your cap and gown. Why? Because of the perfect one. We're not looking at your record. It's bad. We're looking at his. If we get numb to this gospel, as simple as it is, it's so simple, hear me, that some people don't even believe it. Some, that's why you have people in this room. You keep trying harder and you're wondering why you can't get farther because this is not a gospel of trying. This is a gospel of receiving by faith what has already been done for you. Would you stand to your feet today? I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power. Are you feeling powerless? Maybe you need to go back to the basics. Are you feeling burned out on religion? Because you keep trying harder and trying harder and you're exhausted. It's not about trying harder. It is about receiving. The just shall live by faith. All you have to do is believe what has already been done for you is so simple and so beautiful. People reject it for its simplicity. I'm telling you, talk to people. Talk about their objections to faith. They're like, man, I just, I'm, I can't do all that stuff. Talk to somebody, ask them, are you a believer? Man, I'm trying. Huh? You're trying? It's like one of my kids saying, are you, are you Robert's son? Man, I'm trying. What? <laughs> this is not about trying. This is about receiving. And it is out of an understanding, hear me, of what he has done that my life wants to please him. But I'm not doing it for acceptance. I've already been accepted. I've already been approved because of his work. 